let's let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. How is your second week of the semester going? Good. So so yeah, I feel more with so so. Somehow this second week really gets me. Um. So uh, today, let's see what are we going to talk about today. Um. We have uh, last time talked about these two steps um, of, or let's call them components of a machine learning model for an NLP application and uh, application we were focusing on is sentiment classification. And we have seen that first we need to, we can't really work with strings in this space. Uh, string operations won't get us anywhere. What will move us forward are matrix vector, matrix, matrix, uh, and later on tensor uh, multiplications. So we need to have a vector representation of our input. And we have seen a way how, how to produce such a feature vector. And once we have such a feature vector, which we called f of x here, we need to find a model, a function m, uh, that can uh, map that feature vector into um, a decision. And m is unknown, and we are trying to learn m. We assume M is for certain family of model, like a linear model, and then we know we can represent linear models with a certain equation that has parameters, and we are learning the parameters. And we have seen an example of that. We have seen perceptron last time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to see another way of learning M, another M. Um, and then we're going to talk more about tokenization, which was um, influential for our feature vector production. So logistic regression uh, is an alternative to perceptron. And it's foundation for many techniques in this course, including neural networks that we are going to learn about very soon. Uh, in machine learning, if you didn't hear this before, there are two classes of models, discriminative models and generative models. So this distinction is important and people will just say to you, hey, this is a discriminative model, assuming you know what that means. So it's an important term. But what that means is that we are modeling this probability of trying to predict the label given the input, unlike a generative model that try to find joint distribution of these two things. And later on, when we talk about language models and for example, chat GPT, these are examples of these generative models, unlike uh, logistic regression that's a discriminative model. We have seen briefly uh, uh, in the last rush two minutes of the last lecture that uh, the Logistic regression is defined by saying that the probability of um, producing a label plus one, for which for us was a positive sentiment label, equals uh, this equation, which looks a bit scary if you have never seen it before in your life. However, it's actually a form of very common uh, function, a form of logistic uh, function. And uh, in, the, in the last lecture that I used uh, x here, I turned it to z because someone has uh, rightfully pointed out in Piazza that I have overloaded this symbol. Uh, so here, what I'm just telling you is that this is a, just a normal, this is how we write a logistic, uh, 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 an equation for the logistic function. So ignoring this, and if I ask you, write me logistic for a function, you would write a formula like this. And what you, I'm trying to kind of you to see is that this formula here has the same exact same form as the one here, and our z's are um, is the dot product between the weight vectors and the feature vector. Um, the shape of this function is what matters. Uh, importantly, it is uh, has a value of uh, 0.5 when you have value zero. Uh, very small values to the point of approaching zero when. Uh, z uh, gets to my uh, to negative infinity, and when we are at uh, positive infinity, we get uh, one. The way to think about this is then if our dot products are very very large, then we are going to have probability being close to one, and if our dot products are very small, we'll have the probability that's uh, zero. Okay, um, that's important intuition here. If I now tell you that this is a probability of uh, i equals plus one, and that we have only two options, and that they are have uh, the same likelihood of appearing, just as a fair toss of a coin, how would we compute the probability of i equals minus one? Uh, 
one minus this. Exactly. This is the basic uh, basic property of probability. We have only two outcomes, and the sum of probabilities of those outcomes uh, should, is going to be one. So the uh, the formula for getting uh, probability of getting minus one negative sentiment classification is one minus this term, which if you then uh, recombine in a fraction is going to give you uh, this equation. Okay, we are starting with this. Um, now, uh, another intuition I tried to quickly uh, share with you last time is we talked about Pertzertron decision rules, which worked by assigning a positive uh, sentiment label plus one if the dot product between weights and the feature vector is larger than zero. That's the decision we had with Pertzertron. And in a way, we are doing the same thing because if our dot product is larger than zero, uh, that means that the probability uh, under logistic function is going to be larger than 0.5, right? And we have only two options. So that means we are going to choose a uh, positive sentiment label. So this is basically the, the same thing. Um, any questions about intuitions behind this? We're going to now go and see how to learn, uh, learn things. So we are not finished with uh, uh, everything there is to say about logistic regression, but that is intuitions clear at least. Okay. I don't see any objections. If you don't say anything, I will assume as if everything is clear. So, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Generating models are gonna measure, uh, we are modeling, we're trying to find a way to learn this uh, probability, which is a joint uh, distribution between these thing, two things. So uh, for example, with uh, language models that we are gonna you know, talk about soon, um, we are gonna assume that I is just another um, token to generate. And uh, we are generating the next token and the, the uh, joint distribution of these things is gonna be using Marco property. We are gonna have a product of these probabilities and so on. So the whole form is gonna look different because you are trying to model joint distribution rather than this conditional distribution. So for now, um, maybe we can revisit this question again when we later on in the course, when we actually see an example of generating model, what is important to remember, discriminative model is modeling conditional uh, probability of your label given an input, where generative model is uh, modeling joint distribution of these two things. Um, all right, so let's see how we can train uh, logistic uh, regression. Uh, again, we have these uh, weights W that we don't actually know, right? Uh, so we want to find weights where uh, we get these uh, probabilities. Um, as always with machine learning, supervised machine learning, we are going to start with the training data sets of our inputs and outputs. And then our thing we want to maximize is the likelihood. We want to maximize the probability of the true uh, label that we know is true for a given example, I high, given the input and the current weights. And uh, here, I didn't write it, but we use the property that in, and very often in machine learning, we use these properties that our examples are independently, uh, but equally distributed. And here you are using this property of independence because uh, you can write these probabilities as a, as a product. Um, otherwise you would not be able to do that. So we want, want to maximize this product. Uh, of the probabilities uh, of, uh, we want to maximize the probability of um, predicting the correct label. And uh, very often in machine learning, we would rather work with the sum of log probabilities rather than uh, product of probabilities for the stability reasons. So you will see this operation very often where we turn this maximization problem in uh, another way of writing it. What is important here is that logarithm is a monotonically increasing function. So this is possible. If you are looking for a maximum of some function, uh, it's going to be the same maximum that maximum of a function um, applied to the original function if the function we are applying is monotonically increasing. Nothing's going to change in the maximization process. So here we can do this uh, operation. We apply logarithm and we know that the logarithm of a product of things equals to the sum of logarithms of individual things. Maybe I should write this down just in case. Oops. 
philosophy. So logarithm of a times b equals to logarithm of a plus b. That's what we have used. All right, we are uh, we came up to here. Now, um, in machine learning, we uh, like to minimize things instead of doing the maximization because you want to define a loss function and you want to say, I want to minimize the loss function. We have this notion. So either maximizing or minimizing is really not important, but because we are talking about minimization of a loss, we are going to turn all of our maximization problems into minimization problems. How we turn the, uh, the max into min? Well, we just multiply our function with minus one, turn the sign, and now you flip the function and your uh, maximum will become your minimum. And here, we didn't do any operation. Everything we have done over here is defined our loss to be this uh, exact uh, function here, minus logarithm of the probability of the correct class. So here, there is no operation. We are just equating these two things. We are defining our loss. And then uh, the uh, whole thing will be called uh, training objectives. Minimizing, finding the minimum of the sum of these losses uh, we are trying to find weights there that minimize the sum of these losses. This is going to be our training objective. So there is a, just a slight difference in terminology when you say this is loss and this is a training objective. And honestly, sometimes we are going to use them interchangeably as well. Okay, so here, this is actually um, uh, here, uh, this this uh, equation here is something we call minimizing negative log likelihood. Super important term to remember. This is something that people will just say again, as if you know what this means. Uh, once we start to use deep learning libraries like PyTorch, you will have a function NLL. No one will tell you what NLL is. It's assumed you know what NLL is. So minimizing negative log likelihood, mega important concept in machine learning. And now that we have this minimization of a loss, this is great because we can use our hopefully soon favorite algorithm, which is stochastic gradient descent, right? Which we have seen last time. But if we forgot what uh, SGD is, uh, again, SGD, we just use the abbreviation. So get used to that as well. Uh, quick reminder that we start with initial weights and we have this loss function that we want to minimize. We minimize it by taking the small steps in the direction of the steepest descent. And the direction of steepest descent is exactly mathematically gradient of that function with respect to the variables, which here are the weights of the model. So the way to write that, taking a little step in the direction is just taking where you are, taking W, current W, and subtracting uh, the, uh, the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. And the step size is determined by this parameter alpha here. So if you choose small alphas, you are moving like tiny, 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 a little bit until you come to the bottom, if you have a nice convex function, which is going to be slow. So you don't really want to use like a ridiculously small step size. But if you take a large step size, you might have that fluctuation where you go from one side of the function to another, causing major instabilities. You may, might never reach the bottom because you're just going from one side to the other. So choosing appropriate hyperparameter alpha is very important. Typically, there is some kind of uh, knowledge about what right alphas are for your uh, problem. Uh, for example, in deep learning, you will very often see 0 0.001. That's somewhere around this, uh, you will find your good uh, alphas. Okay, so here we are, reminder, we are trying to uh, minimize this loss function. Our loss is defined by the negative uh, logarithm, and uh, we need to calculate the gradient of that loss with respect to our weights. And that's what we are going to see how to calculate now. Yes, please. Is there any reason to put an x symbol to the logarithm? Yeah, yeah, because you are moving um, in the direction which goes downwards. 
And that's going to be uh, achieved if you have the negative sign. If you had used the positive sign, you will move upwards. Yeah. yeah. So that's all it is. Just determining um, where, where exactly. So the negative gradient, I should have said before, is what determines the uh, direction of the steepest descent. Is the age depends on the function of that? Mm -hmm. uh, so gradient will, of course, uh, depend on the loss function because you are calculating the gradient of the loss function. And just a, just a maybe quick reminder of uh, the, the formula for the gradient. So if you have our loss function, no one is shouting at me. OK, sorry. Mm -hmm. So the loss function, it goes from, uh, for us, from RD. So you have a feature vector, which is highly dimensional, uh, to some uh, value R. And um, we get that the dot product or the probability that determines what we decision we're going to make. And the gradient of uh, loss is by uh, with respect to the weights uh, is going to be uh, determined with the following thing. We'll have partial derivative of the loss with respect to each one of the dimensions of um, our uh, uh, weights. So this is just a formula for the gradient. There isn't anything uh, special here. Uh, so of course, uh, your gradient is always going to depend on the form of the loss function you have, and is going to be different for every um, different loss function you have. And also for every uh, you know a value of the uh, uh, w, you will get different values as well. Okay, um, moving on. So um, we are uh, just a quick reminder that we are trying to apply SGD to our logistic regression, where our loss is defined by the negative log probabilities, which is written over here. And now for a moment, let's imagine our gold label is the positive sentiment label, so plus one. Uh, what is this term going to be? Here we are going to plug in the probability of the uh, positive sentiment label that we have seen on the first slide I have shown you here. So what, all I'm doing here is replacing the probability with the uh, formula for the probability, right? Nothing else has, uh, has been changed. And now we need to do a little bit more operation before we actually uh, calculate the derivative. Um, so here, again, we have the uh, logarithm of the fraction. So logarithm of A over B. What's that going to be? How we can defactorize this? Exactly. So it's going to be logarithm here. Maybe I can write it over here. A over B is the logarithm of A minus B. And that's what we did uh, did in this uh, step over here. That's all we did. Uh, not exactly, uh, I lied. Uh, we, we did that. And then logarithm, if you assume uh, natural logarithm, logar natural logarithm of e to the power of something is whatever we are putting e to the power. So here, the only thing that survives is this dot product between the weights w and the f of x. Is that clear? I'm kind of skipping some steps because you should be comfortable with this level of uh, algebra. OK, and uh, here we didn't do anything. The signs have changed because we had no negative logarithm. And now we are actually going to do our derivatives. So here, basically what we have is a times x, and we are doing the derivative with respect to x. So for us here, the this uh, is, is going to be uh, the thing that uh, survives and uh, because it doesn't depend on the w. So think about it as a constant. And here we are using that the uh, logarithm of uh, one, uh, that the derivative of the con logarithm of one, which is a constant, is going to be zero. So that's not important. And here we have the uh, derivative of the logarithm of this dot product, which is uh, uh, more complex. So derivative of the uh, logarithm of x equals one over x. Um, again, maybe I should write this down. So here, derivative of uh, ln x with respect to x um, equals one over x. 
So that's what we have used uh, in this step here. Okay, so this thing uh, ended up uh, at the at the bottom. Um, is this right? Let me just check. Uh, yeah, I have made a mistake over here uh, where this term e this should have been e to the power of this dot product. So here um, it reappears because I forgot it here. I will make a correction of that and remind you over Canvas. And then, uh, of course, this also depends on the W. So now we have a composition, uh, a function that's a composition of different functions that depend on the W. So we use uh, the uh, chain rule uh, and um, derivative of A to the power of X equals E to the power of X. And then uh, again, here we have the this dot product and its own derivative with respect to W equals F of X. So yeah, there is a little bit of derivative computation over there. And in the final step, what we are doing is just uh, uh, factorizing everything by f of x. Uh, we are left with this term. And um, this term over here is our probability of the i equals uh, plus 1. Um, I just rearranged this term, so it comes first. Uh, and uh, that's all we did over here. Questions about this? Okay, just a reminder that there is a mistake here. I will correct it um, in case that confuses you for a for moment being. All right, so we have this um, somewhat nice now uh, derivative. We have uh, written the derivative of our log negative log probabilities in this way. And let's think about what, what does this mean? So if our uh, prediction is that, um, yeah, the there should be, uh, this is a positive sentiment label, then uh, here we will get one minus one, which is close to zero. So this whole uh, derivative will be equal to zero. And remember, we are making updates of the weights by subtracting the derivative of the loss with respect to the W. So if the, 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 the gradient is close to zero, then you are uh, effectively not changing the weights, right? If your model is saying uh, the probability of the positive label here is close to zero, then in this term, we have um, zero minus one. Uh, uh, and this is gonna be close to the uh, minus one, which is uh, basically the perceptron update. And this is not a, like a coincidence. Uh, these are, uh, if you write our no negative log likelihood a loss as a, as a function of z, where z is this dot product, and if we plot it next to our perceptron uh, loss, we will get these functions that look kind of alike, right? At, at, at the extremes, we, they are very close to each other. The region where they differ are uh, when uh, this dot product is close to zero. And remember, that's when the probability equals to a half. So your, your model is a little bit unsure what to predict here. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to call uh, talk about SVMs, support vector machines, but if you have heard about them, you know that the loss for SVM is also somewhere uh, close to here. And a bigger takeaway for me, for you to remember here is that we have learned now two different ways to model binary uh, classification tasks. We found we have talked about two different M's and how to learn them. In reality, they are not widely different algorithms. So the choice of whether you are going to use perceptron or logistic regression or SPM is not a major decision. You might be expecting similar results with these uh, algorithms. Uh, so have have that uh, in mind. Okay, which brings me uh, to the end of this um, part of trying to show you two different functions M to learn. Um, I think now you have at least two examples and maybe you are a little bit more comfortable with how this uh, pipeline uh, is working. Through your assignment, I think you will kind of by working through these implementations, that's gonna really hit the spot if you didn't you know, learn about these things uh, before. Are there any questions? Yeah. 
Like when you're already trying to predict almost directly, there is still like a room for improvement. Um, yeah, I would describe that slightly differently. I would say it's a little bit smoother. So here, uh, especially here, you don't have this very crude decisions. So uh, imagine, um, maybe it's better to go to this slide. Imagine you are somewhere over here and you are just infinitely little to the left. Now you make a completely different decision right here. Uh, from zero, you go into uh, identity function. But here, if you have this small difference, you don't have these huge jumps. And I think that's the um, advantage of, of logistic regression. Um, at the extremes, I, I think you are, if you are close to close to the, you know, to, to similar values, I don't think that matters uh, that much. I don't think the advantages on, in these extremes are uh, the advantage, excuse me, uh, the differences in these extremes are the advantages of logistic regression. Somewhere in this space uh, is is where I think we have advantages. All right, so um, I want to move on to uh, to another topic, which is tokenization, which we already briefly talked about before, right? Uh, but it's this massive topic, and I also want to before. Uh, the drop deadline talk a little bit uh, more about the language aspect of uh, NLP um, just to give everyone an impression of what this course will be about. It's not going to be just about machine learning and uh, learning these functions and, and algorithms like perceptron and logistic regression. So if you think you might be completely disinterested in the language part of NLP, then uh, today is the day to listen and see what you think about this and hearing about it for, you know, especially after spring break for a couple of weeks. Um, and also this is, for me, an example of how and machine learning and NLP are not the same thing, right? Like these things about tokenization and uh, properties of the language we are going to talk about now are specific to a language applications. Then you won't really find them if you are dealing with vision, like images or audio and so on. You will find other issues for sure. Okay. So reminder, what's tokenization? Tokenization is a process of splitting your st input string, like a movie review, into sequence of so-called tokens. And I didn't intentionally define previously what a token is. And uh, it's been fun to, uh, to prepare for this lecture because um, I found this um, reference from a paper in 1992 that uh, is seemingly maybe, I'm not 100% sure, but might be the first time that the concept of tokenization uh, has been uh, coined. It's it's mentioned in that paper, potentially for the first time, which is funny to think about it today if you're an NLP researcher. It's kind of like a thing you know for ages uh, since you start to work in NLP. So uh, it's funny to see that some time ago it was mentioned for the first time. And in this paper, tokens are defined as basic units which need not to be decomposed in a subsequent processing. So kind of weight, right? Um, and I think through uh, through examples, we, we will get a sense of what that could mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last time I mentioned the white space tokenizer and we'll talk about it more, but I do want to illustrate that the space of tokenization is really big field uh, in NLP. Uh, this wonderful survey from uh, Sabrina Milke uh, has proposed this taxonomy, and I will not go over the details of this taxonomy. I just want to give you like a quick impression that there is way more here than just the white space tokenizer that we have mentioned uh, last time. And what we are going to kind of uh, work to is to see this data-driven, learned, simple tokenizer, which are the core of the current modern NLP models and uh, our core of the technologies such as GPT-4 and ChatGPT and uh, any of your favorite latest large language models. But going a step back, so we talk about white space tokenizers and tokens here are implied to be actual words, which is great because we do understand what words are, so it's easier to think about it, right? 
Uh, I have given you last time an example. This text is in this film is interesting as an experiment, but tells no cogent story. If you use white space tokenizer, you will end up with a list of individual words. This film is interesting, so on, but the story with the period would be deemed as one a token, which we said is a, is an issue. So tokenization in a very crude programming way is just splitting your string variable into a list of strings. Okay, and here each one of these new strings will be uh, more or less individual words. We have talked about different failures. We said ideally isn't uh, would be split by is uh, and uh, not written in this way. Uh, hyphenated phrases would be split into two words. Uh, punctuation would also be separated from the individual word. And what I didn't say last time, but it's also massively important is that some languages don't use spaces to mark word boundaries. Um, so in those languages, that's not an option, right? How can you split a word via space when space doesn't mean that new word had um, appeared? Um, and I will get to that in a second, uh, but um, I will first make a digression into what happens if a new or infrequent word appears when we use white space tokenizer or tokenizers in general. As, no, white space tokenizer. Let's, let's stick with white space tokenizer. Um, this is uh, something someone had asked also on Piazza, which is a great catch. I totally forgot mentioning it last time. It's super important. Um, and I will first go over a few concepts. And these terms are, again, super important uh, in NLP. We will, again, just write these abbreviations, assume you know what we are talking about. So first term is out of vocab vocabulary or OOV. These are words that are seen very rarely during training or not even at all. And then we will talk about closed vocabulary, vocabulary models, where we assume that the vocabulary is fixed and you don't change it. So you are not, um, these kinds of models are unable to produce words, forms as seen in the training data. So for example, if I had sit in my training data and I have it in my vocabulary, but during my test time, I have now encountered word sits, which is just a word form of the word sit, um, I wouldn't know what to do with it. It's not in my vocabulary. And I would need to in more or less toss it out and we'll see how we are tossing it out. Uh, opposed to closed vocabulary models are open vocabulary models that can deal with the new unseen words on fly. And then there is a concept of unknown tokens, U and K, uh, UNC is how I call it, but probably no one else does. Historically, rare word types were replaced with a special token we add to our vocabulary during training. So you have your vocabulary, uh, that you determine in whatever way you did. And you just add another token, this unknown token, and give it the last index you have. Or you maybe start with it and give it the first. It, it that really doesn't matter. And then at the test time, anytime you don't see a new, this new token, you just replace it with this unknown token. Okay? Just assume this is unknown. And this is a... A huge issue. Now we all, it's really nice to teach NLP now that you all know what, uh, you know, ChatGPT is. Imagine your ChatGPT, you ask it, hey, uh, what is the capital of Croatia? And it says, the capital of Croatia is UNC. You know, it's it would be unusable. So that's not an option if you're generating words, right? For any text generation application, generating unknown tokens is not an option. That would be a very funny user design. Um, but even if you are not generating words, you lose information by replacing these unknown words with uh, unknown tokens. Uh, going back to the example of sit and sit, you have seen sit, so you do know something about words sitting. Can't you use it when you see this new unknown form of uh, this verb? Can you somehow realize it's the same verb, but new form of it and use the uh, whatever representation of the sit you have known uh, before, you know. Um, so, and in again, going beyond English, 
um, in many languages with productive morphology, and we'll learn what morphology is in a second, but it's basically when you inflect words a lot, you like sit, sit is an example. Um, this is not an option. You will have so many unknown words then because uh, there is just so many way to, to change the word inflected that now if you start to discard all of those, you will have too many unknown tokens and your processing of that, of that language will be incredibly hard. So we have seen two issues with, uh, with white space tokenizer so far. We have, or more, we have seen that there are many language phenomena that uh, white space tokenizer can't deal with. We have said that in certain languages, white space is not the way that we uh, split words. And now we have seen that we will have an issue of unknown tokens uh, and that will just lose lots of information or for text generation is simply not an option. It's not something we can even start with. So what we're going to talk about now is what are the alternatives to this, right? And one alternative that you might now have in mind is, well, why don't we use characters, right? That mm, a lot of alphabets have a fixed set of uh, characters. Um, it uh, doesn't really matter if we have seen new words because we have seen every character in the, our training data um, and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, if there is no white space as a way to split the words, it doesn't matter because again, we are working with characters. So uh, this is an example from Jurovsky and Martin. They have used an example from Chinese uh, language and they say to consider this uh, sentence, uh, Yao Ming reaches the finals and point to a work in 2016 that pointed out that this could be treated as three words. If you use Chinese three bank segmentation where you, uh, Yao Ming is a, is a one, one word, uh, reaches is the second and finals is the third. Um, but if you use Peking University segmentation, then you would have five words. Yao, Ming, regions, overall, finals. Um, and and uh, finally, the last option is that you just, um, you just ignore the words and you uh, assume this is a sequence of seven uh, characters. And in fact, for most Chinese NLP tasks, it turns out to work better if you just assume this uh, characters rather than trying to do these options uh, over uh, over here, since um, this is reasonable for a lot of applications people have uh, have tried. So, yeah, why don't we just use this then, right? If this this seems reasonable, the issue is that uh, again we can't have this approach doesn't work well for the other family of languages like English and other languages. Uh, in Latin, that are written in Latin script, but that use white space to separate words because now your your model needs to learn that uh -huh, uh, there, there is a notion of word in this language and uh, these words in this language are typically uh, you know separated by the white space. So your model needs to learn way, way more information that if we just assume words initially would be given to the this model. So we'll again lose information, but in another way. So decomposing into characters, again, universally doesn't work for all language families. Any questions so far? I get very excited about tokenizers. I don't even know why, so I'm rushing a little bit. Yep. Um, I think, um, I don't know exactly what the conclusions in these papers are, so I definitely recommend opening the, uh, for example, Li et al. 2019 and checking what their conclusions are. I suspect um, uh, the, the reason is what is said here, uh, since characters are at a reasonable semantic level for most applications in these uh, languages. So characters here, give you enough information to induce what the meaning of this whole sentence uh, is. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like if we, you know, I'm, I'm sure this paper had actually compared all of this and draw more deeper uh, conclusions. 
All right, so words don't are not great. Characters are not great. So can we use some kind of linguistically motivated units? Um, the choice of the, I didn't say this before, but whatever we choose as a, our unit for token is going to be important. Uh, later on in class, we are going to talk about linguistic annotation and structure. So uh, your annotators will see these units and they are going to select that unit and say, you are a verb, you are adjective, and so on. So choice is uh, really important. And, you know, for me, or for a lot of people, then if you, if you are going to have this um you know, annotations later on, doesn't it make sense the most to choose whatever linguists would say uh, these uh, units should be. Um, however, we have talked about this a lot, a range of phenomena already. So from this phenomena, we know that it's hard to identify and to consistently define what the best linguistic unit would be here. And um, we'll see with uh, other phenomena, that it's not always, it's not like linguists know everything about language. I mentioned this in the first uh, class and there that we are still discovering how language is structured. So there will be phenomena where we don't have unified theory. For example, negation, uh, it doesn't have a unified uh, theory or modality as well. Um, I mentioned that the white space is, is a separator that's universally used with the Latin script. So that could be, uh, uh, um, you know, a reasonable idea. And this is how the idea of using white space tokenizer had emerged, of course. Um, and I want to just to briefly make a digression. We also have talked about different way of normalizing tags by uh, using lemmatization and stemming, stemming and stop word removal uh, and so on. Um, this is important uh, to know. If you are doing text normalization and then tokenizing your text, then uh, your tokenizer is not uh, reversible, meaning you cannot recover the raw text from the uh, tokenization alone. And these days you won't really find this situation, but if you work with more classical NLP approaches um, or maybe in other languages, I, I, I'm not sure, this this is gonna happen a lot. Um, and I mean, I did say with pre-trained language models, it won't happen, but actually there are pre-trained corpora that have been given it in a tokenized form and it's hard to recover the uh, raw form of text. Uh, so have this uh, in mind, this impracticality of just sharing data sets in a tokenized uh, form. Okay, uh, so just uh, this was a little digression. We have seen uh, that our white space tokenizer, not great. Our character tokenizer, good for some languages, not for all. Uh, we have double in the idea of to using some linguistic units for tokens. And we have concluded that that's gonna be hard. There are just too much phenomena. So um, what we are gonna now learn about is something called subwords. Um, and yeah, great. So what has happened with neural models in NLP is that people have observe that um, just using some kind of subword tokenization when you don't really have a full word, but you don't really have a character either somewhere in between, that's not linguistically informed. So it can be complete gibberish, the subword you end up with. Uh, if you use this kind of segmentation uh, in machine translation, it boosted performance significantly. And uh, we, we are going to talk about how advances in machine learning led to what we call large language models today. But uh, the fact that it was massively important for machine translation speaks that it was massively important for the NLP as well. So we have seen this scientific result. And then we have also uh, in 2018, there the, there appeared a technical requirement that we work with the closed vocabulary models, assuming a fixed uh, fixed vocabulary size. So we couldn't really at the test time include new uh, words in our vocabulary. So in current NLP, the notion of token and tokenization has changed. Uh, tokenization is a task of segmenting the sentence into non-typographically and therefore non-linguistically motivated units, which are often smaller than classical tokens. The classical in a sense, the token, you can interpret it as a person. It's like a word or a character. Um, and these, these kind of units are then called subwords. Sometimes also word pieces, but 
at, in 2018, subwords and word pieces were used interchangeably, and then subwords had, I think we settled on subwords. And typographic units, what we call now old tokens, uh, are also called pre-tokens. And what has been used to call tokenization, such as white space tokenization, is now called pre-tokenization. Um, and I'm not making this up. I'm not making anything up. But this is like a legit term, for example, uh, in um, Hugging Face is, a, is an organization that has built libraries that are used by everyone who works on models that's going to be open source. So entire NLP research today is written in this library. Uh, Hugging Face has library for training models, for tokenizers, for evaluation. Uh, this one is for tokenizers. And here you can see that there is a whole uh, directory of free tokenizers. And this is somewhere where you would find your white space tokenizer, for example. Um, if you go on the readme, you'll see that you can, I'll link this somewhere uh, later on, but you can easily use tokenizers uh, that we are going to talk about now uh, using this uh, library. So it's a it, hugging face at some point will become a thing you know very closely. I've, I've, we will try to make you uh, use some of these libraries, uh, library specifically one for training. So yeah, I recommend checking this out uh, later on. Uh, I don't think we will have explicitly in any of our homeworks that you play around with these tokenizers. So um, if you're interested, try, try it out. Um, all right, so white space, bad, characters, not great. Uh, we turn everything in subwords. Subwords are these um, units uh, that are not linguistically motivated and they are smaller than your actual words. Um, all right, so I said something that was slightly, little, slightly too strong. I said like subwords can be complete rubbish and gibberish. It, can have no meaning whatsoever. And while that's totally possible, when we actually um, uh, implement these uh, tokenizers for finding some words, they very often do bear meaning. They are often either full words or uh, they are something like a su suffix, like uh, est here or er, which um, enables you to understand certain forms of the word. So for example, um, when we uh, make super lively or something, um, uh, even if we didn't see the exact form in the test, we if we have seen the the main form, we will still understand what's going on. So I will go over some linguistic terms again, a small digression because um, these terms are important and you should know about them. Uh, again, you will just see them being used uh, in the literature. Uh, morpheme is the smallest meaning bearing unit of a language and uh, for example in unlikeliest has the morphemes un uh, prefix likely and uh, est our suffix um, and this is a uh, this is what I wanted to say uh, before maybe you haven't seen unluckiest in your test uh, data it appears for the first time you haven't seen it during training and with word, word with the white space tokenizer you would just think up oh, I don't know what this is, we're gonna replace it with an unknown token and move on. But if you have this subword tokenizer and subword tokenizer splits it into these three tokens, un, likely, EST, you have very likely seen un and EST before because these are very common prefixes and suffixes, right? And um, if this uh, word likely, for example, it is very common word as well. So you have seen all three components and now you can use their own representations uh, later on. And you didn't lose any information. This is, this is what we are at. Morphology is the study of the way words are built from morphemes. And um, for example, at ACL, our flagship NLP conference, there will be a track where you can split, uh, submit if you work on morphology. Uh, I have mentioned the term word forms before. Word forms are the variation of word that express different grammatical roles. So sit versus sits, right? Um, so for example, we express when something happened with verbs. Um, we express whether something happened in the past, present, or future, and this is something we have in uh, English too, right? 
Um, in many languages, not really in English, we have, I mean, to some extent we have in English too, but in other languages, we have ton of cases, which are, um, it's a process of inflecting a noun or a pronoun and their modifiers to express the relationship of this word with other words uh, in the sentence. Um, English has largely lost in its inflected case system, but for example, in Croatian, in my native language, each noun has seven cases and a uh, plural form of that noun also has seven cases, but that are, you know, uh, different. We use different suffixes to express uh, the cases of plural words. So there is a lot of uh, cases uh, in this language. And, uh, you know, I, I think Hungarian has more than a dozen. So in other languages, we like to change words uh, a lot. Uh, we have number, whether a word is singular or in plural. And then again, not really used in English except for pronouns. Uh, words in other languages uh, may have uh, genders. Again, okay, example in Croatian, every word has a gender. Um, it's nice that we have uh, rules for determining gender of the word. Like if you end up word with A, that's gonna be a feminine word. In German, I lived in Germany for almost four years, never managed to get fluent in German. Every word has a gender, but the rule, there is no like really <laughs> comprehensive rules. So for every word, you need to learn its gender, its a nominative form, and then plural is very often irregular as well. So for learning one word, you are actually learning three words, which is oh, very annoying. Um, so yeah, gender, gender is a big aspect of language in uh, uh, other languages as well. Um, so yeah, this is, this is important because uh, I, I hope what you're hearing that we have a lot of word forms. So uh, having these subwords that we are trying to figure out how we are going to extract is 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 important. Uh, and as I said before, with the example of unluckiest, even if you haven't seen the word before, but you have seen it morphemes, you can then you don't lose information because you can combine the words from the morphemes that constitute it. Okay, any questions about this terminology? Yep. Pre-tokenization. That's a great question. Um, I will answer it when we go over one of these algorithms. Um, it's basically going to be a pre-step to doing what we call now tokenization. Yeah. Okay, so now white space is not great. Character is not great. Subwords, we want that. How to get subwords? Um, I will go over one algorithm called byte pair encoding, or very often abbreviated as BBBPE. Again, we'll just write in a paper BPE. We'll not uh, spell out the whole thing, so it's good to know what this uh, refers to. Uh, this is actually algorithm that is proposed as a compression algorithm in 1994, so totally unrelated to uh, to language. And then uh, Sandri uh, and their collaborators had adopted it for the uh, machine translation in 2016. And um, there is a little bit richer history here. If you are interested, uh, check this paper by uh, Galet uh, in 2019 that shows that it's not like sorry uh, that um, th this algorithm has been coined in this paper, but other people have used it for other things. And the main idea here is to use our data to automatically tell us what the tokens should be. So we are determining our vocabulary by through through going through our data. And you need to start with a big corpus of your language to enable this. Um, so you start with a big corpus of uh, English language, for example, brown corpus, and you are going to apply this algorithm. The output of this algorithm will be a vocabulary. And then when you get a new word, you can use the algorithm to segment it into these tokens in your vocabulary. Um, I have also another digression. I'm trying to give you these linguistic terms uh, as, as I go. Uh, Types are distinct tokens in a corpus. Um, so if we look at the vocabulary, actually what we see there are distinct types uh, and then different occurrences of those types in text are tokens. I don't think you should know the difference between types and tokens in case you see, see it mentioned somewhere, but I will use tokens uh, for, for everything we talk about. Okay, so let's see how we can learn 
the tokens from the data. What, what's, what is this algorithm? So we are gonna start, as I said, with a raw train corpus. And uh, we are gonna now pre-tokenize the corpus, meaning we are gonna split it into usually words, or maybe a little bit, not just white space tokenizer, but tokenizer that can actually split punctuation and th those kinds of things. Uh, Moses, a tokenizer comes to mind. And to every word, you're gonna spend this special like underscore symbol uh, at, the, at the end of the word. You're going to initialize vocabulary with set of individual characters you have seen in your train corpus. If your train corpus is small, you might not see all characters in your alphabet. If it's large, likely it's gonna just be the letters in your alphabet plus some extra signs. And now this is what you're not gonna do. This is the main operation. You're going to choose two tokens in your current vocabulary that are most frequently adjacent in your data. So let's say our vocabulary consists of uh, A, B, C, and A, B appear very frequently together. A, B is going to be what we are going to merge uh, and add to the vocabulary. OK? So that's the operation. Find the most uh, frequently adjacent tokens and merge them and add them to the vocabulary. We did pre-tokenization, so we are going to respect the word boundaries. So that's why we are doing the uh, tokenization. We are not a uh, pre-tokenization. We're not going to merge symbol that cross uh, boundaries of two words. Um, once we have merged our symbols and uh, extended our vocabulary, we are going to change all the occurrences of these two selected tokens with a new merge tokens. So if we had uh, a and then B, now that's gonna be merged into A, B. And we are going to do this until K merges are done. And I, I'm gonna show this through an example again. So don't worry if, if it's not entirely clear, we are gonna go over this again. Um, obvious question might be, what are the best, uh, what, how, many, how many merges should we do? Uh, the number of merges is gonna determine the size of your vocabulary. Something that I don't want to get into now, but it's going to be massively important later on for computation when we start predicting next word. Um, we don't want this to be too large. It's going to be bad for us later on. Um, and there isn't, uh, there isn't really a clear cut answer here. This is an open research area. I recommend that you check section 6.6 .6 in uh, this survey I mentioned before. But you, what you will see with pre-trained language models today, that 30,000 is a, is a common vocabulary size. So that means that we do about 30,000 merges. Okay, so let's go over this example and then I'll stop and see whether there are any, uh, any questions. Uh, so this is our small corpus. It consists of only these uh, five words, low, lowest, newer, wider, new. Um, in uh, Jarofsky, Martin had also measured the occurrence of these words in the um, in the corpus. Um, we don't use it in algorithms, so I don't know why exactly that was mentioned there. Uh, I think we can ignore it. And when we look at the individual characters here, uh, we would get this vocabulary. So that's what we initialized our vocabulary uh, to. So now the first, uh, first um, step is to find which uh, which of these characters over here, which of them appear together the most? And I wish I can ask you to tell me what that is, but it will probably take forever. Um, so the answer would be that E and R appear uh, together the most. So we are gonna get, uh, add ER, uh, this new string to our vocabulary. And uh, excuse me, but previously we have split our our uh, words, our strings by these uh, these uh, characters. So each one of these, you can imagine it as being a list of L, O, W underscore. So now here E and R, which are separate, they are, imagine I'm being in a list, you will replace those two elements in a list with this new string E, R, which you see they are a little bit closer. Okay. So we repeat this again. We find which of the uh, of which of these uh, tokens that we have in vocabulary appear together the most, 
and it turns out that er underscore appears the most. So that's what's gonna be added to the uh, to the vocabulary. And instead of having er and underscore separated, they become uh, merged in the corpus. We repeat this, uh, the most uh, frequently occurring tokens are n and e. So we add n and e as a string into our vocabulary. Repeat and remove the their separate occurrences in the corpus with the merged string, and so on. If we have repeated this uh, more times, this is the vocabulary we would end up with. So we would have er er underscore any new low low newer low. So you can see how how uh, we got this. Um, the, some of these are just like subwords and they don't really have meaning, right? As we have uh, discussed before. And you can imagine, okay, if I didn't really have uh, newer, but I had ER and new, I would split my word newer that I potentially didn't see into new and ER instead of just saying it's an unknown word. All right, so are there questions about this procedure? Is it clear why, like, I hope it's at least clear why are we doing this? Yeah. No, sorry, I'm a little confused between the difference between the uh, corpus and vocabulary. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, may I address the time complexity of this, of this operation? Yeah, I don't know the time complexity now from my um, top of my head. So that I can check it out and let you know. Um, and the first question was the difference between the corpus and vocabulary. Yeah, so corpus is a collection of texts. So imagine a collection of all Wikipedia articles. Each Wikipedia article is just a gigantic string uh, that we have in um, our you know, uh, code. That's gonna be a corpus. Uh, vocabulary, uh, think about it as a dictionary where each key here is an individual token that appeared in our corpus with an index. Um, and tokens are, as we now, I guess, uh, all know, it's not really cl clearly defined what tokens are. But what we are converging to is that token is this subword. And subword is not really linguistically explainable. It can be either, for example, here, low is a full word, right? Newer is a full word. But then NE, it's not really anything, right? It doesn't sound. It doesn't sound even like a prefix or suffix. So uh, it can be any of like, yeah, these are meaning bearing things or or not, because we are learning them automatically from the from the data. So yeah, in short, this is your vocabulary that you would index these these list of these substrings, subswords is a vocabulary, but you usually index it. And uh, your corpus. Silly corpus is just this collection of few sentences, but in reality is a massive corpus of text. I also saw that sometimes the word has the, the little underscore. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between ER and ER underscore? Yeah, so this, uh, this underscore signals that this is basically the end of the word. Um, and I mean, we do this because we want the model to respect the word boundaries. We don't want to merge symbols that cross this uh, cross this word uh, boundaries. So you end up with these. Um, yeah, here you would. Uh, I, I guess this tells us. Okay, this is er, but er that uh, is very is appears at the end of the sentence, so it's more like a suffix. Where er without underscore might be. Okay, this is a subword that appears, but not really at the end of the end of the um, uh, word. Yeah. yeah, and not all uh, subword tokenizers respect word boundaries, so there are some that do not do that. Other questions? Yep. What's the number um, below to the corpus? Uh, these numbers. Yeah, so um, I, I took a screenshot of these examples from Jurovsky and Martin, and these uh, these numbers are the occurrence of each one of these words in the um, in the corpus, but we never use it in our algorithm, so you can just ignore them. I don't I don't know why they mention it there. So, as far as I'm concerned, in, ignore that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we have our vocabulary, and now 
we want to split our sentences, right? Uh, and what we are doing is we just run uh, our BPE on the test data uh, by merging what we have learned from the training data greedily in the order we learn them. What this means is, for example, we first we segment each test sentence words into characters. Uh, then we apply the first merge rule, which in our example, replace every instance of E and R in the test corpus with ER. And then our second merge rule was, if you remember, ER underscore, which means that now we merge all occurrences of ER underscore and change them in a, in a string. So we do basically what we have done before, but now we know we have we we have we know which kind of merging we should do. We are not we are basically keep, keeping a step of finding which uh, ones uh, appear the most frequently together, and um, and uh, merging them. Instead, we use these rules to to merge them. Um, is this clear? Okay, and I mean, we had this silly example. So the, the ones, the firm mer first merges we did were kind of arbitrary, right? And it might be, doesn't seem like you really want to merge ER first, but remember that we have found um, tokens that are most adjacent together in a large corpus of our language, which means that very often these are the things we should merge uh, first. So as long as you start with the large corpus in the beginning, you will make sense, like reasonable actions, uh, reasonable first merges, right? Um, instead of with these silly examples where we chose to merge e ER, which I, I I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but doesn't feel like it's the most important merge in uh, English language. Okay, so that's it. This is our uh, byte pair encoding, BPE. Super important, can't stress enough that this is important to know. This is where many of the things you will end up using start. Um, as I mentioned before, it is implemented in Hugging Faces uh, transformers. So uh, if we go, oh, no, no. Over here, you have a really, really nice uh, quick example using uh, this library. So here you just import BP tr uh, trainer and then uh, you can train your uh, BP algorithm on the data you have. So maybe try it out, especially if you don't speak, if your native language is not necessarily English, maybe try out and see because, you know, many of us can't understand maybe those languages, but you can, so use the opportunity to see uh, how, how it works. Um, and GP3 use BPE as well. Uh, we don't really know whether GPT-4 is using it. I suspect they do. If you look at their report, they mention for GPT-3, they are for GPT-4, there is a mention. And again, you have uh, OpenAI doesn't release many things, but they do have this nice uh, library of uh, for tokenization, uh, which have lots of uh, useful um, capabilities. Uh, so I recommend checking it out. And then there is this nice demo where you can learn about how GPT-4, which is the base of ChatGPT, uh, tokenizes things. Um, and uh, I don't know whether they have examples, maybe? Show example. Oh, great, they do. So here you have um, uh, this or whatever text. And then this shows you how many tokens and characters there are. Uh, each one of tokens is colored with a different color. I apologize if you don't see colors well because it might be hard to determine where the the the, the boundaries are. Uh, but for example, many words map to one token. So here we have seen, we see that there is this nice splitting of uh, Don and uh, apostrophe T, which we wanted. And then here you see, um, indivisible. It's a little bit strange word. I mean, for me, I don't hear it a lot. So uh, it seems like GPT-4 model also uh, in its training corpus for BPE, whatever it was, we have no idea. Uh, it wasn't really a common word. So it also ended up being split uh, in these two uh, pieces into these two subwords, uh, indiv and isable. Again, linguistically makes no sense, right? Um, yeah, and then you get these uh, weird things with numbers. And uh, I didn't reference in these slides. I will send it later. And I hope I remember uh, to do everything I said I will do for you. And if not, please uh, remind me. 
but yeah, how to how to segment, how to split numbers, it's it's really uh, unclear. And if you're just learning it from the data, you might end up with like why are why did we split this? It should be, uh, in my opinion, just a sequence of these numbers together. Um, yeah, so play around with this as well. And this brings me to um, almost another topic. Uh, before I go into something related, I do want to mention that there are other subword tokenizers. Uh, most commonly, you will hear about word piece, which is uh, very similar to BPE, but decisions we make about what to merge is not based on which tokens appear uh, together most often. It is based on something else. And then we have Unigram LM, which works entirely differently. So just be aware, I don't have time to go over every single one of these, uh, but be aware that uh, there are different ways to produce subword tokenization. BP is not the only one, but it is, I would say, these days most frequently used one. All right, so I, I mentioned there is this demo, and this brings me to another thing. So um, these models like ChatGPT, uh, they are not accessible in a sense that you can download the model and then you can, uh, you know, um, uh, do something with the, you know, actual model itself. Rather, you have APIs and you can just query the model as you, you might uh, have done yourself already. Um, and for, if you want to uh, query it a lot, you need to pay uh, API. So more, uh, more you query it, uh, more, of course, it's going to be expensive. And API's cost is measured by the number of tokens processed or generated. So uh, uh, for example, if I have a very short sentence, it's going to be cheaper to process it than if I had a very long document by GPT-4. For the first time, I pay making the numbers up, I don't know, 10 cents. And for the latter, I might pay $3. I have no idea whether these numbers make sense, but uh, it's going to be like more expensive the longer the input release. And the issue here that has been reported by the uh, published paper last year by He et al. is that subword tokenizer lead to uh, disproportionate fragmentation rates for different languages and writing scripts. Uh, so here on the x-axis, you see different languages. And for on the i-axis, you see the average number of uh, of uh, tokens uh, by by actually the script in the same data set. So we use the same starting point. In um, this corpus is translated in uh, many different languages. So the content is exactly the same. We trans it's translated in different languages. Uh, but what you get is that uh, these in for these other languages the uh, fragmentation is higher. And what does this mean? Uh, so this means that. For these languages, you're going to pay more. Uh, here, again, on x-axis, we have language family and script. And this is cost of APIs relative to English. Uh, so uh, if we have different Latin uh, languages, the cost is going to be about the same or higher. But here, if we go on the, the extreme portion of the, if we have uh, uh, Tibetan or Georgian or Telugu, Tamil, Bengali, uh, the rate is six times or higher. For processing the exactly same content, that's important. It's not like we are given two uh, different sentences. These are the exact same sentences just written in different languages. But then in, uh, in, if, if they are written in some languages, you have to pay uh, for some almost tw 12 times more, which is a lot, right? And in this paper, they also measure the correlation between the cost of API and uh, something called human development index, uh, which is a statistical composite index of life expectancy, education, and per capita income indicators, which is used to rank countries into 40 years of human development. So it's kind of approximation of how developed a country is. And what this shows us is that the more developed the country is, according to this index, the cheaper the API is, which doesn't make sense, right? Uh, if we want to make progress in the places where we need to make development uh, or increase the development to match it with the other countries, then the cost of APIs for those countries should be lower. So this has huge uh, societal impacts, something as silly as tokenization, which, which is really important. And, you know, like learning about nitty gritty details of large language models of what we call AI this today really pays, uh, pays off. Okay, so on a more funnier note, uh, 
tokenization in our space is also this like joking point like no one really likes it i mean you 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 debug your model and then you find all sorts of stupid tokenization uh issues um so i'll just show you some for example uh, there has been a paper released like this week that shows the gpt work gpt4 uh, doesn't work very well for code and this is something important to remember. Uh, these days, these models are not trained only on natural language. They are also trained on code, on entirety of GitHub. But the procedure is exactly the same. You still use BPE and tokenize your code. And of course, I mean, natural language, tokenizing natural language and tokenizing code, and it, should, it should not be exactly the same. So that paper, which I didn't cite here, shows that the GPT-4 can't really do many things with the code uh, yet, and someone else has re pointed that every single example that has been shown is due to the faulty tokenization. Um, here, not that paper, uh, I just wanted to illustrate to how funky people, uh, how funky things people do when they want to deal with this, uh, with this stuff. So here uh, in this work, they have introduced this uh, like a white space uh, token to, to be able to uh, deal with the uh, tokenization uh, better. So you induce this like little hex uh, in your, you know, uh, corpora to be able to produce proper tokenization, which is not really how in, this is not elegant, right? In our, in our field, we wouldn't, we don't really want to do stuff like this. Remember, we started from manually designed features and machine learning to end-to-end -to -end learning. So we hate any kind of uh, interventions. Then here, nat natural phenomena like the, the critics or a little easily human readable noise lead to unexpected BP sequences and catastrophic translation failures. Uh, here we have a sentence in uh, Arabic. We are trying to translate this sentence into English. Uh, and then uh, the proper translation, I'm Canadian, I'm the youngest of seven kids. Um, you can ignore this, this part. This, is, this paper has found another way to tokenize by vi visual tokens rather than tokens we have talked about. Uh, if you have used BPE um, and tokenized this sentence with a little bit of noise, uh, you would end up with a translation which says, we grew up as a teacher and we gave me a hug. Not great, right? So. Um, again, robustness issue stemming again from the tokenization itself. Um, and then I think this is my final example here. BERT, our beloved BERT, thinks that the sentiment of super bizarre is positive because its tokenization contains the word superb. So super bizarre is, is split as superb, ISA, RRE. And of course, the model is confused, uh, rightfully so. Uh, so many downstream issues uh, really appeared from tokenization. So really pay attention to how your text is tokenized. Try to understand whether it makes sense. Very often you will just uh, be stuck with whatever tokenization the pre-trained model had used because these are closed vocabulary models. As we have learned uh, this term today, that means that we just don't have an option to tweak the tokenization, but it's good to be aware of where the issues uh, might come from. Uh, I didn't, don't have slides for this, but again, I recommend that you check that survey paper I have shared. And there, the first author, uh, the authors, excuse me, have uh, gone over more no, like futuristic ways of thinking how we could go about tokenization. So if this is interesting, I recommend checking the last sections of that survey and just seeing what people deem we could be doing uh, in the future to fix uh, some of these tokenization issues. Okay, um, any questions? We are about done. All right, good. I will try to share everything I promised uh, I will share. <laughs>